And uh, before we forget, if you are in Los Angeles or if you will be visiting Los Angeles the uh, the week before the Academy Awards, which are on uh, February 9th this year, it's crazy. So it's crazy. early. They used to be at the end of March, yeah. and they bumped oh. it up the end of February, and now it, it just this year alone, because they're going back to end of February next year. Yeah. This is too early. I, well, our friend Francesca tells me that she can remember when they were in April. Really? April. You know that's true. They were they were much later in the year in the thirties and they they were yeah. like in May and June in the in the thirties and forties for yeah. a minute and then April yeah it's yeah. been moving back well, ever see, since. and then you know the little floaty thing back yeah. to February but yeah this is super duper early put a crunch on us I'll tell you that man you know sure and, and frankly a couple of these films didn't quite make it out in time that's true you know the, fa- yeah. the fact of the matter is there were a few movies that I would have thought about if uh, there had been a little bit more time. Well, if you're going to be anywhere in Los Angeles, come on down. Go to go to uh, scpr.org uh, and or the or the Ace Theater, um, the uh, the Ace Hotel and Ace Theater homepage. I don't mm-hmm. have that handy. I should yeah. probably. Yeah, it's easy but, to find. But Tim and I will be on stage at the Ace Theater the re- with the rest of our Film Week colleagues on Sunday, February second, uh, recording the uh, the Film Week Oscar show, which is always a lively time. Clips from the movies and. Uh, Panels of critics up there arguing and debating and hopefully sometimes agreeing with each other about what will wit- win what and what deserves what. And mm-hmm. Larry Mantle hosting the whole thing in his inimitable and stylish way. Uh, it's always a good time. And that show has sold the the Ace Theater out, all 1,200 seats or whatever, yeah. uh, every year since we moved to the Ace Theater a few years ago. So it's been uh, it's been really uh, it's been terrific. And the Ace Theater is, of course, the old UA Theater. It goes all the way back to the silent era. It is Hollywood history, so you get to see Hollywood history on uh, in two ways. That happens to be Super Bowl Sunday, which is why we're having an earlier yes. show. It's an it's, earlier it's a, show. Uh, I so. think 1, uh, I guess, p.m. Yeah. Uh, and so, then yeah. everybody can go home and it, watch Super Bowl. can do both. Yeah. That's the other thing that this accelerated schedule has done is it's pushed us back onto Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. So, uh, but if you if you don't care about the Super Bowl, hey, come on down and, uh, and spend an early morning on the 2nd, February 2nd, with us. Uh, so, um, hey, here is the, uh, so here's the, uh, well, here's where we're going to get started. We're going to get started on, um, uh, some cl- uh, more classic movies. We have a whole bunch of, uh, really, really cool stuff to go through. We have a ton of Kino stuff, but I wanted to pull one Kino title out ahead of time and then go through this other stuff. And, uh, that is the Hitchcock British International Pictures Collection, um, this is a big deal because Kino has put together a collection of Hitchcock's British films. It does not include The Lodger, which was his original uh, yeah. British silent, but it's the rest of them from that immediate post-Lodger period. Uh, the Ring from 1927, The Farmer's Wife from 1928, Champagne also from 28, The Manx Man, a very famous film from 1929, and then The Skin Game. Uh, starring Edmund Gwen, of course, who would be, become very famous for uh, 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 the Christmas classic uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, that from 1931, The Skin Game. Um, these are all really significant films that have only been available in really bad public domain releases previously. And um, it's a big deal that uh, that Kino went ahead and uh, and pulled these together. Uh now it's a it's a wonderful t- little two disc set. Everything is beautiful. It's Blu-ray. It's all cleaned up. You get audio commentary from uh, Nick Pinkerton on The Ring. You get audio commentaries on Champagne the Manx Man from Farron Smith Nimi. Um and uh it's it's really uh, it's a it's a very very important collection of films for Hitchcock purists and for Hitchcock completists. And uh, you finally get to take all of those just dirty, dingy, disgusting public domain things that you bought for like five bucks at the at, at some bargain bin and throw them away. They won't sell. They don't take them anywhere. Just get rid of them. This is all you want. So this is a really important thing. Bravo to Kino for for putting this together. It plugs a hole in everybody's Hitchcock collection, and that is important. Um, also, uh, from the same general relevant period. Uh, is Trapped, the, which is a, a, an amazing classic noir that everybody kind of forgot about at a certain point. The Film Noir Foundation, the UCLA Film and Television Archive, restored it. Flickr Alley has released it on Blu-ray with a bunch of wonderful, wonderful extras. This was made in 1949 and uh, is, is one of the, um, really one of the most underrated noirs of the time, 
especially considering that it was directed by Richard Fleischer, who yeah. is not necessarily known for noirs. Noir, He's yeah. known for you know uh, his his genre films. He's known for um, uh, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, and uh, 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 what's the what's the microscopic one? Uh, oh uh, yeah, oh yeah, the uh, um, uh, where where Raquel they, Welch gets injected. They shrink him down. They yeah. inject him to yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Drawing a blank on the title, but yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike, what was that called? Oh, God, was it Voyage to me. the Bottom of the Sea? No, no, that was a series. That was a series yeah. and a movie, but oh, he right, didn't right, do it right, yeah. anyway. Um, so terrific stuff, but he made a noir, he made a really good noir in, in Trapped. And this is a Blu ray and DVD dual format double disc set, so you get them both here. And uh, what a wonderful uh, restoration it is! Um, really, a really a, a sharp film, uh, Barbara. Uh, Peyton was, uh, this was her very, very first role. She would go on to do a lot of other really, really cool roles. Uh, Lloyd Bridges is the star. He is also super, super young at the time. He plays a, you know, a counterfeiter who's trying to make a fresh start. And of course, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't quite work out that way. Um, really a, a terrific, cool film. Really smart, really well written. Anyway, it gets a souvenir booklet, 24 pages. Uh, Alan K. Rohde and Julie Kirgo do a terrific audio commentary track. There's a little remembrance of Richard Fleischer and a documentary all about the film that includes interviews with everybody that they could possibly uh, wrangle at uh, this late date and, uh, and more. So, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Trapped from uh, the Film Noir Foundation UC in the UCLA Film and Television Archive and released by Flickr Alley. Fantastic Voyage. It's bugged me. Had to go look it up. Thank Had to go look it up. Fantastic Voyage. Uh, she'll be 80 this year, Raquel. Yeah, it doesn't 80? matter. She's aged. Yeah, fantastic. Ridiculous. Fantastic. And, and then as long as we are in the, uh, in the same general period, I uh, want to make mention of the Cotton Club Encore, which has kind of gone under everybody's radar a little bit. This was at, te- was it Telluride? Telluride? Mm. Premiered at Telluride a few years ago. Um, Coppola went back and he re-edited The Cotton Club based on the only version of the director's cut that he ever had, Mm -hmm. which was on VHS. And he went and dug that out of the closet and looked at it and said, damn, that was a better cut. Yeah. And for those who don't know, The Cotton Club was a very troubled film. It, um, you know, it was taken away from Coppola at a certain point by Bob Evans and the, the other producers and they recut it and they slashed it by more than a half an hour in length. And um, there's also the whole Cotton Club murders thing going on. With yeah. the, I mean, there's a book written about it. I won't get into all the details, but people died because of cocaine deals that were associated yeah. with the financing of Cotton Club. It's yeah. a nut. It's just a. It's it's crazy. But here's the thing: the Cotton Club was always a really interesting film. Always very much in the vein of Coppola's uh, Godfather work. Yeah. Because it's a gangster story yeah. set in the twenties at the famous Harlem Music Club where you could perform if you were black, you just couldn't be in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, a lot of gangsters migrated through the affairs of the Cotton Club. Dutch Schultz yeah. and uh, Lucky Luciano, who are all represented in the film. James yeah. Remar plays uh, Dutch Schultz, Dutch Schultz as yeah. horrific as anybody can. And this is all before Bugsy and all the rest of those movies and Billy Bathgate started sort of celebrating the same collection of characters. And um, Coppola went back and he recut the film based on his VHS thing. And then uh, MGM tried to pull the the rug out from under him by refusing to release it. Well, anyway, whatever the deal was, and I tried to find out, um, Lionsgate was able to get permission to finally release this. And what a spectacular film it is. It is so amazing. Among other things... They the story of the Heinz brothers yeah. is given equal relevance to the story of Richard Gere. Uh, as, yeah, and Richard Gere, the, the trumpet player, the Heinz brothers, or the, the 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 dancing quartet, sort of representing. Uh, oh, the, yeah, yes, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the the what are their names? The two brothers, the two brothers uh, from 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 the era. Yeah, uh, a fantastic uh, debut from Gregory and Maurice. Yeah. Uh, Heinz, uh, yeah. back in the it's fantastic stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's it's real, and it, and it gives balance because it's suddenly not just a Richard Gere film. Yeah. Now it's a film about musicians, and it it's it it you know you find it, the way he cuts it is that it very early on they're fellow musicians. There's no race barrier. There's no yeah. class barrier. There's nothing. It's only in the club yeah. that those barriers appear. Yeah. But outside on the street, they're brothers. And um, and then of course the real split comes between the actual brothers. Yeah. And it's really it's fascinating. It's really really fascinating. It's the Nicholas brothers. The Nicholas brothers. Nicholas yeah. brothers that they're based on. But the the connections to history here are just so beautiful. And there's an introduction to it from Coppola, 
and then a Q and A, uh, and y- y- you know what? Not they, to mention young Diane Lane. Young Diane oh Lane is just magnificent yeah. here. The only thing this doesn't have is the theatrical cut, ah. and that's the thing that I'm missing. And 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 that's not on Blu-ray, by the way. There is no Blu-ray theatrical cut of the Cotton Club. So mm. my hope is that that we get both of those because, like with Brazil and and uh, Legend and other movies that have these troubled histories. It is really instructive. If you're aspiring to be a filmmaker and you want to understand how the system works, it's really an education to see what a director cuts versus what a studio cuts. Yeah. So I'm hoping that the theatrical cut does make it out as well. I don't want that to disappear. It's inferior, but my goodness. And a ton of new numbers, by the way, that were never in the, in the, in the finished film. New numbers that are spectacular. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the ill will... Uh, sequence is still one of the greatest things that I've ever seen uh, uh, in, in like the past 30 years. Lynette McKee just nails it, absolutely nails it. We talked about her last week, didn't yeah, Bruce yeah, Miller. Sure yeah, so all right, uh, a little what, bit of movie little, stuff. Yeah, let, let's do some, some more movie, TV stuff, whatever we got still left over from last <laughs> well, let's week. Let's knock yeah. off a few of these movies just before we go on. What did I start with? Big Trouble in Little China, totally. Totally Rock love it. John Carpenter's Big Trouble love in 1986. It. Love this movie. Love it. Uh, Kurt Russell, Kim Cattrall, Dennis Dunn. Uh, talk about a movie, uh, you, know, you, you know, more than more than 30 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, um, who, that, um, uh, put to work a whole bunch of, uh, of Asian, I guess we'll call them actors. Yeah. Uh, this movie yep. in 1986 had all the Asian actors in Hollywood uh, working. James Hong, Victor Wong. Donald Lee, Carter Wong, Peter it's Kwan. It's just a fantastic movie. Susie Pei. Uh, it's a wonderful movie. A lot of fun. Uh, Kim Cattrall uh, so in, good. in this movie. It's so much fun. Uh, and, you know, uh, this particular disc is packed full of special features. So audio commentaries from the producers and uh, uh, several of the artists, audio commentary with Carpenter and, and, and Kurt Russell, isolated score, uh, television spots, interviews with most of the actors, including most of those actors that I just mentioned, Dennis Dunn and James Hong and Peter Kwan, which I really, really did, uh, 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 Donald Lee. I really love that they're all on this release here because, you know, there have been other releases of this and you didn't hear those voices uh, uh, talking about this and the yeah. film and all that kind of stuff. So this is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China, Way to Go, Brother. Yeah, love that movie. Uh, Stacey Keach, and um, right after her, her turn in Halloween, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, in Road Games. Um, uh, a Richard Franklin film uh, down in Australia. They were working, and so so Jamie Lee had already yeah. had made uh, Halloween with yep. you know John obviously, yep. and had become something of a star. This movie she had made before she made that movie, though. Hmm. So this movie benefited from the fact that that movie uh, came out be- before it. Well, really, really, really good movie. Uh, this she runs on television all the time. Wonderful here with all kinds of special features. Uh, in, including uh, interviews with uh, with Stacy and the commentary from the cinematographer Vincent Montin and, the, and uh, yeah, all the folks who worked on the film. Just really, really great stuff, including a wonderful audio commentary with director uh, uh, Richard Franklin. Uh, it, 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 Shades of Hitchcock, this film. Fantastic. Uh, which he talks about in the commentary there. So good, good stuff awesome. there. Uh, what do you got? Got a couple from Severin, um, sort of in the exploitation realm, which is what Severin does. One of them is uh, The Perils of Gwendolyn in the Land of Yik Yak. Yeah. A lot of Perils of Gwendolyn movies over the years, but this is the one that kind of does like a soft core take on it. Yeah. And uh, it's star- you know, written and directed by uh, Just Yakin, J-U-S-T-J-A-E-C-K-I-N. One of those um, loony, you know, soft corey, um, uh, uh, flesh Gordon type directors from from Europe. Anyway, this is 1984 when all that stuff was kind of in the mix, uh, and it's silly and lame and uh, maybe a little bit funny. Not really worth anything else. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, it, it the the significance of this is that it was thought lost. And was recently um, was recently rediscovered, and presumably this is one of the films that uh, fundamentally helped launch Severin as a company. So, anyway, um, it's okay. I mean, it's you know, it's it's like Flesh Gordon. You don't watch it because it's it's titillating or because it's good. You watch it because it's odd and a weird artifact of the era. But. Um, a lot of extras on here, interviews and featurettes and all kinds of stuff. Tawny Katane, 
who of course would go on to be you know really big in uh, in music videos. Um, it's all here. And there's an, there's an audio commentary with Tony Katane and Brent Huff. There's an audio commentary with USDX, and everybody's everybody's here to talk about this. So uh, they're not hiding anything. The perils of Gwendolyn in the land of Yik Yak. And then the other one. This is interesting to me. The Boys Next Door. Yeah. Nelpy yeah. Spheris from the same year, 1984. So um, Charlie Sheen and uh, Max Caulfield play. It's basically like a natural born killers thing except instead of a guy and a girl it's two guys yeah and uh it's a low budget penelope spheris uh kind of a pseudo exploitation film these two kids who just uh they're they're you know they're they're like the the, the they're like they would be high school shooters today but instead they they're outcasts so they leave high school they come to la and just want to go on a, on a crime binge yeah um it's very well done it's very disturbing and uh, it's especially disturbing to me because this is the film that Charlie made right after we graduated. Now, Charlie didn't graduate, um, but uh, the rest of us graduated, and then Charlie went uh, took a dive right into this. So I watched this, and I'm like, that's the Charlie I knew in yeah, school. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, well before, you know. Well before everything went. Winning. To, well before winning. Yeah, well before everything went way south for him. Uh, went up and first and then south. Yeah. But... Um, it's also interesting because just a few years later, he was suddenly in a Best Picture winner. Yeah, yeah, Platoon. I mean, just two years later. Yeah. Literally two years later. Yeah, yeah. So it all rose pretty quickly for, for Charlie and then crashed uh, fairly precipitously at a certain point. Very sad. But nonetheless, um, really an interesting film. Uh, and especially in the career of Penelope Spiris, who went on to do all these kitty movies, you know, uh, the, the 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 little rascal. Oh and yeah. Else. So yeah. it's so interesting what a, what a turn her career took, and Max Caulfield too, who's kind of disappeared. So yeah, uh, that's worth checking out. The Boys Next Door from Severin on Blu-ray. A uh, couple over here, including Prophecy, 1979 film from John Frankenheimer. Uh, which uh, was a little bit of the, its time, uh, if, if, if you think about it, because it's really about the environment. Yeah. Uh, today we talk about the environment all the time, uh, global warming, uh, global climate change, uh, uh, mutated this, that, and the other thing. This film was about what the logging industry was doing uh, in the uh, in, in in this area, and in, in it ends up they end up mutating a bear into this sort of giant monster, and it's just it's this horror film. But that's what it's about. It's about this doctor, Robert Foxworth, and Talia Shire. They go out to there, I'm on Asante in the film, and this is this giant bear monster going around killing everybody because uh, we're not taking care of the environment properly. Um, so you know, uh, some forty years ahead of this time, John Frankenheimer, pretty intense movie. Good special features on this, including interviews with Talia Shire and Robert Foxworth and uh, Ryder David. Seltzer and the uh, the special effects master Tom Berman and Alan Up Apome, uh, who built all of these creature effects. Today, all of that stuff would be digital, obviously. But in 1979, you still had to, you had to build all these things, uh, and it's one of the things that that make this makes this movie play uh, much better today than it would if it were all digital. The fact that they built a whole bunch of stuff and and ran around with it out there in the desert. Of uh, the fan, uh, it's a very interesting 1981 film. Uh, starring Michael Bean and Lauren Bacall. Interesting sort of crossover of generations there. Lauren Bacall Terrific. sort of at the back of her yeah. career playing this uh, legendary Broadway star. Very young Michael Bean, who, of course, we would go on to know from the first Terminator film, uh, or knew from the first Terminator film. But uh, very, very young Michael Bean playing this uh, young man, a uh, record salesman, which is funny because, you know, a record salesman, um, yeah. uh, who's obsessed with her. Uh, and starts stalking her. Uh, all kinds of wonderful people in this movie, including James Garner and Maureen Stapleton and uh, Hector Elizondo. A very intense, very uh, fraught film, uh, which I rather enjoyed. Uh, yeah, yeah, great performance from Lauren Bacall, Robert Stigwood uh, production, that. Uh, the 1980, I believe it was a 1985 film, Silver Bullet, adaptation of a Stephen King novel. Silver Bullet. Uh, remember going to, remember, remember going with my wife to see this movie. My wife loved Stephen King. I bought her every single hardback copy of every Stephen King novel ever made, and she took me to see this, and I rather enjoyed it. It was pretty neat uh, a film uh, with uh, Gary Busey, Gary Busey in the movie, young Corey Haim in the movie, kid uh, in this wheelchair. Gary Busey uh, takes this wheelchair and outfits it with a motorcycle motor <laughs> so the kid uh, can ride around about 60 miles an hour. Turns out that there's a, uh, yeah, a, a, um, uh, a werewolf roaming around the town, and it's all about uh, how they negotiate that stuff. Neat little movie, stands up pretty well, 
Thoroughly enjoyed it myself. Corey Haim, uh, Gary Busey, all kinds of special features on this, including a commentary with Martha De Laurentiis of the De Laurentiis family fame, yep. who's one of the producers on this, uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the the editor audio commentary with uh, the director Daniel Attis. Uh, isolated score, great stuff. Uh, so you know, from 1985, collector's edition, uh, Stephen King's Silver Bullet. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. A uh, few other classic, well, sort of library catalog things here. Remember Jawbreaker? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The only person who kind of came out of this uh, who still sort of is working is Rebecca Gayhart. And yeah. She's not really on anybody's list. Rose McGowan now uh, just loses her mind on Twitter every few minutes. Yeah, well, um, yeah. issues, issues. And uh, Pam Greer and Carol Kane were also in this, holding it down for the older generation. The the three in this, though, this is the 20th anniversary. Rebecca Gayhart, Rose McGowan, and Julie Benz. Wow, in I should junk it for that movie. I know, it's nuts, <laughs> right? That burn. Uh, burns. Written and directed by Darren Stein. This was a TriStar release 20 years ago and kind of um, predates all of the other high school the yeah. uh, Mean Girls things, yeah. right? I mean, this came was, along uh, yeah. twenty years later. Album, yeah. yeah this was sort of later. this was kind of the beginning of of all that stuff, and uh, it comes on it after Heather's. Yeah, it's obviously after Heather's, but it's all still in kind of that same general vein. Um, and uh, yeah, Heather's. The, yeah, the, the late eighties. Po- the the politics of Mean Girls is um, interesting, and it's always good fodder for movies. And these three are particularly interesting. And Rose McGowan is a good actress. This is, uh, you know, people forget that sometimes they just associate her with, um, with you know, her the TV. whole Harvey thing, yeah, yeah, the Harvey thing, and and uh, and a handful of you know her TV stuff when she was on uh, the, the the Witch series. But anyway, Jawbreaker, two twentieth anniversary edition, that is out. Also out from Classic Flicks, F-L-I-X, is the 1947 uh, comedy classic. Kind of a screwball comedy thing from the 19, uh, of, of the genre. Anyway, from uh, 1947 is uh, Out of the Blue with George Brent and Virginia Mayho, also starring Turhan Bey and Dvorak and Carol Landis, who had quite, a, quite an interesting history. Carol Landis was a one-time girlfriend of Busby Berkeley, had a career as a call girl previous to that that uh, sort of ruined her her relationship there, but would go on to do many, many movies. Very beautiful, really good in a lot of the stuff that she did. Had high-profile affairs with uh, Daryl Zanuck and uh, eventually Rex Harrison, who mm. dumped her to stay with his wife, and then she killed herself at age 29 yeah. just the year after this. So this is one year before her, her death, and it, and it makes it very sad. But Virginia Mayo is wonderful here. Um, everyone else is absolutely wonderful, and um, the uh, the story was written by Vera Kaspari, who wrote the source material for films like Laura and A Letter to Three Wives, and um, really, really great. And uh, Lee Jason, who did a lot of screwball comedies, uh, direct. So this is a nice little gem from the uh, 1940s, otherwise overlooked, out of the blue, on Blu-ray from Classic Flicks. And uh, as long as we're mining the uh, the old movie stuff... Wow, what a bizarre thing. Special edition, 1500 uh, copy edition only uh, from the film detective, a 2019 restoration of Iga. (laughs) The name written in blood. Iga. E-E-G-A-H, if you'd like to know how to spell this. Uh, This features the uh, Mystery Science Theater version from 1993 which is how most people even know about this. Yeah, the film's from the 60s, I think. Yeah, and, and, um, and then they, you have the film Legit, without all the funky commentary and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's just it, Richard Keel, who would go on to play uh, Jaws in the James Bond films, mm-hmm. uh, Spy Who Never Loved Me and uh, Spy Who Loved Me and um, uh, Moonraker, uh, stars here, and he was also in some episodes. If you're a member of the Wild Wild West, oh yeah, he played Miguelito Loveless's big, big uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's kind of he gets confused with uh, with Lurch a lot, but anyway, Richard, <laughs> Richard Keel plays a he plays a giant caveman, uh, and um, that's, uh, you know, in the in well, he's a caveman who in present day don't worry about how or why. And um, he winds up having certain run-ins, literally and figuratively. And um, uh, you, you get into a there's, a... there's a there's a funky rock and roll 
subplot to this involving Arch Hall Jr. Yeah, uh, who's still alive and still works. Yeah, it, it it it's it's really a silly movie. It's just just uh, completely. You'll unreal. notice you'll notice the movie is directed by Arch Hall Senior, Senior. Yeah. who's also in the movie. Yeah. And uh, although Hall's it's directed Jr. by him under another name because it, he didn't want, yeah, he, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't have a movie directed by Arch Hall Senior starring Arch Hall Junior, yeah, and not have it really hurt Arch Hall Junior's uh, career. Anyway, Arch Hall Junior talks about some of that here on the uh, yeah. on the in the uh, with the interview, and then Joel Hodgson of uh, Mystery Science uh, does a little interview here about the film's relevance as well. It, it's it's this is loopy, uh, <laughs> but anyway, there it is. It's Ega. Yeah, yeah. Arch Hall still hanging around, still working, yeah. still working. We're gonna do a, do yeah. a couple of TV. You got yeah, hit some TV. Uh, the Chaperone uh, from the creator of Downton Abbey, a very good series. Elizabeth McGovern also in this series, set in the twenties. It's about a young actress, uh, yeah, Bon Vivant, uh, the, uh, who wants to go to New York and uh, join this dance company and and do all this st- stuff. She's a rule breaker, and uh, and uh, her mother uh, decides to allow her to, in fact, go to New York and do all of this. But she has to be chaperoned, and who is her chaperone? Uh, but um, uh, Elizabeth uh, McGovern, uh, uh, and uh, who doesn't break rules and wants to do everything exactly right. It's very sweet, very sharp, very funny. Uh, they both change a little bit. The Blythe Danner in the film, Campbell Scott in the film, uh, written by Julian Fellows, of course. It's uh, it's just a perfectly lovely, sweet set in the twenties. Exactly what you would expect yep. to come from Julian, uh, who I thoroughly enjoy. That Downton Abbey film, by the way. Don't know if I ever had any in any any thoughts about it being relevant in the Oscar run. Yeah, but I, but I thought maybe the Dame. I thought maybe the Dame. Yeah, no. Might it's get recognized. TV adaptations don't. Don't get no, a lot almost of love. never. Almost never. Fiftieth yeah. anniversary of Sesame Street. Just wonderful. Hosted by Joseph Gordon Levitt. Love Joe Gordon Levitt. Yep. Uh, as we uh, look at 50 years, 1969, technically speaking, uh, when uh, Sesame Street hit the airwaves of, um, of, of PBS, everybody shows up in this, obviously, in- including some very recent uh, contemporary sort of folks, including Sterling K. Brown and, and Patti LaBelle and Nora Jones, Elvis Costello, all kinds of folks in this. Um, uh, bonus features in- including includes a very specific set of commentary from, uh, from Elmo called Elmo's World and Celebration. So anyway... 50 years uh, uh, worth of uh, Sesame Street is absolutely fantastic. Love Sesame Street. Can't go wrong with that. Um, This is a very, very wacky three-film collection called Royals in Romance. All right. So we have... uh, Does it include Harry and, uh, and Meg? Yeah, <laughs> two of them are about Harry and Meghan. Yeah. So uh, Harry it's and not up to date, is it's, 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 No, no, yeah. not the new, not the new, <laughs> not the new stuff. They're gonna have to make another movie for that. Well, the first one is actually William and Kate, and it's all yeah. about it's all yeah. about the whole William and Kate sort of thing that went on. And then uh, 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 Harry and Meghan, a royal romance, which is uh, you know uh, set prior to them. It's set for when they met, and it's all shaped. You know, here she is, the divorcee, and and she meets this uh, young prince, actual literal prince, on a blind date. And they fall in love, and then the uh, the third one is uh, Harry and Meghan uh, becoming royal, and it's all about everything that happens post the engagement, right through the wedding, and and, and all of that business. It's a three film collection. If you're a royalist uh, or something like a royalist, I suppose that you'll uh, need to add this to, to your collection. But you'll have to sit back and wait another year to see how this new business with the royals turns out as they sort know, of what do they, they, they call it Megxit? They're calling it Megxit. That's so unfair. Megxit. That's that's so cruel. unfair. So Actually, I have to admit, though, there are memes floating around comparing her to Yoko Ono, <laughs> which are really <laughs> funny. I mean, it's like you know, putting her face and his over John and Yoko's, or or inserting Yoko's face over hers. It's very they, funny. That makes Harry John Lennon, which is perfectly <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> So we're not no we're not doing that. Steven Universe, the movie from Cartoon Network, a feature film, uh, a full uh, eighty two minutes long, uh, featuring the uh, characters from the Steven Universe series. Uh, fantastic. He thought he was all finished uh, saving Earth from the diamonds, but no, there, there will be more trouble, and it will take uh, sixteen new songs <laughs> and original music uh, added to the original Steven Universe in order to save uh, Earth one more time. Uh, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed this uh, as a series. I have not did not actually watch this whole 82 minute long movie because I'm an adult man and I have life. Uh, but I'm assuming that it's okay. Uh, Hayden Turner and Paul Doc complete fifth season 
of the series, uh, back again, the series. I, I always uh, thoroughly enjoyed the series. Love the history, uh, w- w- the, the, the historical context in which it is set. Young man returning from America, the Revolutionary War, to England uh, to find his uh, fiance. Oh, who all of his people thought he was dead. His father's dead. His fiance uh, is is uh, engaged to his cousin, and it's about how he negotiates a new life in England after having gone off to America to fight in war. A beautiful series. Uh, been on for years, by the way. I think this might be the third, maybe second or third yeah. incarnation of this series, because uh, there was one in the there was one it's, in the there was uh, one in the seventies. They're all really good, uh, but they're all really 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 good. Yeah. I got some got some music here. I'm going to go through just some uh, some of the live performance and opera stuff uh, from Naxos. We got a whole bunch of it and want to get y'all kind of caught up on it um the uh, the first one here from bel air classique uh we got two from bel air classique and the first one is really really terrific i'm i'm this is i don't to my knowledge this has never been out in any performance before on blu-ray it is uh kurt vile's street scene book and lyrics by elmer rice and langston hughes really really an interesting uh, thing this is performed by the orchestra and chorus of the uh the real de madrid theater teatro real de madrid and it's absolutely beautiful. It's just wonderful. Um, if you don't know Kurt Wilde, then your you know three penny opera and all that stuff probably not going to really respond to it. But it's one of the all time great American operas, and it really is uh, very nicely done. the uh, The Langston Hughes and, and Elmer oh, Rice yeah. book is really really superb. One of the all time great uh, opera books for any American opera. It's really really good. So uh, wonderful Spanish staging of that. Also from Bel Air Classiques is uh, Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, which uh, is done by the Bolshoi and uh, the orchestra and chorus of the Bolshoi. Um, just really wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, so accomplished. Everything Bolshoi continues to be really, really top, top. Uh, and uh, let's see, Tchaikovsky, you can't ever really go wrong either. Yeah. Um, and then from Naxos proper, we have uh, Ambroise Thomas starring in Hamlet. This is the um, this is a really kind of a fascinating Hamlet performance. It's not at all what I was expecting going in, um, eh, because it's it's all it's the, basically a French staging of it, and a uh, it includes the orchestra of the Champs Elysees, and um, Hamlet is played by Stéphane Degout, and it is quite um, unusual. I'll just say that it's a it's a modern day interpretation. It's not exactly what I expected, but it is. Uh, it is nonetheless. Um, it shows you the flexibility of the of, of Hamlet as a story. Uh, I got a couple from uh, Richard Wagner, uh, Der Fliegende Hollander, uh, from the uh, the- the- Theater an der Wein, das neue Opernhaus. Mutilating my mother's mother tongue, but I don't care. Uh, and then we also have Tristan and Isolde. Uh, as performed by the uh, Teatro della Opera di Roma in Rome, and the uh, I will say Tristan and Isolde, as, as long as it is, and it's like five or six hours long when they perform it, is really impressive. I've mm. seen it live. I saw it here in Los Angeles, a different staging of it, but it's um, it lends itself to some really, really uh, aggressive and interesting uh, stage direction and art direction. And uh, it, it, it's it's just superb. So I don't miss that. I would say the uh, the other one, you know, uh, Die Fliegende der Oliver is is okay, but it's kind of minimalistic and not really that engaging. Uh, Orphe, Orpheus and Eurydice, Orphe et Eurydice by uh, Gluck, uh, based on the original Hector uh, Berlioz version. That is also out in a new uh, production from the Opera Comique in France. Really interesting. There's also three from Dynamic, uh, also distributed by Naxos, which is Mascagni's Cavalleria Rusticana and uh, Antonio Carlos Gomez's Lo Schiavo and Offenbach's uh, Amari à la Porte, uh, uh, Husband at the Door. Um, all three of those are unusual and little-known operas, but this is the first time that uh, any of them have been on video uh, of any kind, VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, whatever. And uh, so on that level alone, if you are an opera purist, you'll probably enjoy them. Ah. Uh, a couple movies. Yep. Uh, interesting, this, Beverly Hill, Hills Cop, uh, three-movie collection. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 
Interesting because Eddie, uh, you know, uh, coming off some recognition at least at the Golden Globes uh, for uh, career achievement, I uh, thought that you yeah, know that was I lovely. Uh, yeah. the, the Golden Globes I, at I, least figured something out. I thought he would get. I really did think I he thought would he get would, an Oscar nomination. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was going to get an Oscar nomination too. But you know, they, they, so anyway, there he was. Um, this in Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills Cop Two, Beverly Hills Cop Three. Eddie, of course, has a uh, Coming to America. Um, 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 I can't uh, believe they're doing a sequel to that. A sequel so to that, weird. and they, and 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 another uh, and another Beverly Hills Cop um, uh, is on the way too. So you know, uh, they they say you can't go back. What's interesting is Eddie more or less looks the same. It's uh, wild, isn't it? Is yeah, you know, you know, stick Eddie in this Detroit Lions jacket and and put that gun in his hand and he put that grin on his face yeah. and he'd be like, yeah, <laughs> Axel, Axel. That was that was the beauty of of uh, Dolomite is my name is the fact that it's the Eddie of old. Yeah. He got right back. He gave him a role that let him get into his groove, and he was able to kind of do it, but still give you a great performance. Yeah, effect care. Sure, I mean Rudy Ray Moore, actual person, but yeah. for Eddie, a character. Yeah. Because Rudy Ray Moore was a character as a yep. human, but and then of course you have the other character, Dolomite, whom he's playing. And by the way, this is the thing that's been bugging me that people have not been recognizing across. I know we're talking about the Beverly Hills Cop package, guys. Yeah. This is all going to make sense in a second, um, um, is that uh, you know, people just don't seem to have recognized how complicated that was. Rudy Ray and Dolomite, not Different. the same person. I know. I know. And he plays that so beautifully and subtly in the context of yeah. that film. Uh, you know, beautiful, heartbreaking speeches as Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, when he's revealing himself yeah. and he's very, very, and, and the, you know, it's in the writing, yeah. but of course Eddie recognizes this too. And then when you when it's time to pull that ripcord, yeah, as Dolomite, he, he pulls that ripcord, and that's why he should have been nominated. Nevertheless, I agree. Three movie collection, uh, all of the Beverly Hills Cop movies. These movies were a hell of a lot of fun. The third one with uh, the whole thing with uh, Sylvester Stallone's uh, ex-wife and all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah. kind of overshadowed what was going yeah, on in yeah, that yeah. movie. Yeah. So that was a bit of a mess. But hey, you got two good movies out of three. What the hell? Yeah. Um, uh, a Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. Um, the only really good film from Dito Montiel, uh, 2006 film, which gave us um, uh, some interesting actresses that have gone on to uh, Robert Downey Jr. and, and Chaz Palmentari in the movie. But this movie gave us Shia LaBeouf, uh, a young right, actor. Right, it did. This movie gave us a young Channing Tatum, um, uh, all of whom have gone on to do some interesting stuff. They all, uh, you know, being... Good guys went back and worked for Dito and a couple of other movies, Man Down and Fighting and a few other things. Uh, but this was the one movie that uh, where everybody really got something good going on. A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. All kinds of special features on this, including uh, audio commentaries from the director uh, and the editors and some of the producers and, 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 and whatnot. Uh, 11 deleted scenes with optional commentaries, too. Now, look, 11 deleted scenes? Look. If you got 11 deleted scenes uh, on a film that you made, particularly an independent film, you should have wrote a better script. Uh, you should have wrote a tighter script. Uh, if you could shoot 11 scenes that you can completely take out of your movie and still make a coherent movie, you should have sat down. And So that's not a good thing. When I see a whole bunch of deleted scenes on a DVD, Blu-ray, that's not a good thing, uh, generally speaking. That means that some screenwriting passes got overlooked. Yep. Uh, and uh, and a director had to fix all that crap. So anyway, just pointing that out for the kids in school. <laughs> oh. Got a few more on the uh, music and performance end. Uh, let's see, where would I start with these? Just knock these out real quickly. Uh, Complete Symphonies of Johannes Brahms. Gosh, this is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Pavel Yarvi, Scandinavian conductor, uh, does this. This is also this also includes the Brahms Code, which is a uh, documentary, a music documentary by Christian Berger on the uh, uh, on on Brahms generally in his music. But this is a wonderful, wonderful collection from C major. Uh, Brahms wrote wonderful, wonderful symphonies, uh, four in total, and um, it's just beautiful to see them conducted by such a great uh, conductor. So this is uh, Pavel Yarvi and the uh, the Bremen Philharmonic in Germany. Uh, it's a beautiful Blu-ray set from uh, C major and Unitel. And then we also have uh, Carl's Jen Carl Jenkins, The Armed Man, A Mass for Peace. Uh, Carl Jenkins conducted the World Orchestra for Peace in this very unusual performance. It's not exactly my kind of music. Uh, it's a little bit more modern classical, which isn't my kind of thing. But uh, it's quite, a, quite an audiovisual multimedia thing that they stage. It's really worth checking out. They did this uh, in November of 2018 at the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin. And it really is, it, it's an impressive thing that they mounted. So even if the music doesn't work for you, the, 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 the opulence and the, uh, 
the the spectacle of the thing probably will. Uh, Rebecca Penny's pianist performs on Blu-ray Legacy. Rebecca Penny's plays Frederick Chopin. Um, nothing spectacular here. It's just it's just wonderful performances from uh, 2016 of Rebecca Penny's uh, Rebecca Penny's Piano Festival and performing Chopin and and it's lovely and it's beautiful and uh, you, you have to really ad- admire the interpretation if you're familiar with Chopin. Uh, also have Liam Gallagher as it was. This is a um, uh, a documentary about Liam Gallagher, uh, which is pretty rough if you know all the demons oh, and, yeah. and what he what he dealt with. Uh, it, it's pretty rough stuff. This is from Screen Media and um, worth watching only, I think, if. Uh, if you if the name Liam Gallagher means anything to you, that music from you know all that, all that music from the uh, him and his brother, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, you know it was a mess. Those guys, it's it just it's it's rough. Uh, it's really rough to watch. It's just it's all it's every rock cliche that you can possibly imagine. Um, we got uh, Toto Forty Tours Around the Sun on Blu-ray. These guys are still rocking it. They're still going, and uh, the songs still sound good. Some of them sound even better. This is from uh, Eagle Vision and Universal. It's really, really a, a, a great collection. Um, everything is here. Everything that you want to hear. It's a. It's. It, this was a, a, a an Amsterdam performance at the Ziggo Dome, and um, it's beautifully photographed. It's nice. Uh, really nice. Nice stuff. Uh, Toto. Forty tours around the sun. A lot of a uh, lot of great stage presence there. Got uh, a, a couple of these are both interesting special edition Blu-ray DVD and CD set of Humble Pie: The Life and Times of Steve Marriott, plus the 1973 Complete Winterland Show. Now, a lot of people out there, uh, if you're of a certain age, you're gonna go, "Who the hell is Steve Marriott?" Uh, can't help you there. Got to go on to got to go onto the internet and 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 do a search. You'll you'll find out. But worth finding out. There are a ton of things on here. Anything and everything related to this legendary 1973 Winterland show in particular is really, really interesting. Um, rockumentary, different versions of the songs, um, interview, there are interviews with Peter Frampton on this as well. I mean, it's uh, everyone who was in any way associated with Steve Marriott or Peter Frampton is also interviewed here. Um, jam sessions. I mean, it's it's really, really interesting stuff. Uh, so Humble Pie, The Life and Times of Steve Marriott, the and the complete 1973 Winterland show, all on this Blu-ray, DVD, and CD combo set. And then this one really took me back. Le- Kenny Rogers, The Gambler's Last Deal. This is Kenny Rogers' final concert tour on DVD along with a bonus CD. I wish it was Blu-ray, but it isn't. Uh... You know, this was all shot at the London Palladium in 2017, right at the end of Kenny Rogers' very, very last world tour. And it's all of his hit songs. And you know what? They, the only person who doesn't show up on here is Sheena Easton, and that's too bad. But um, Dottie West shows up. Linda Davis shows up. Um, the Gambler, Lady, uh, Lady Luck. Um, every time two fools collide. I mean, it's really, it's, it's quite, it's, it's, it's really quite a thing. And Kenny Rogers is no spring chicken anymore. Yeah, dude's, yeah. dude's nearing the, uh, the twilight years, but yeah. he still, he still pulled him in. And then the, the last few here, uh, just to wrap up the whole performance thing, Il Devo, uh, timeless live in Japan. This is a, uh, singing quartet of, um, uh, a, a group that has been going around for about 15 years. Uh, known as Il Divo. It's kind of a classical pop crossover quartet of European singers. And uh, if you're not familiar with Il Divo, then don't worry about it. It's not your thing. But people who know Il Divo, they follow Il Divo in a big way. And um, they do all of they they do their usual crossover mix of stuff uh, from this performance that uh, they did in 2018 in Tokyo. And... Um, Wonderful classical compilation uh, of stuff here from uh, that was recorded at the Maltings Concert Hall. This is uh, anchored. This is from Naxos. It is basically uh, anchored by Saint-Saëns' Carnival of the Animals. Also includes Ravel's Mother Goose, Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf, uh, Benjamin Britten's The Young Person's Guide to Orchestra, uh, and 
it's just uh, it's just a wonderful collection of classical pieces that sort of deal with animals and cater to children. And uh, if you want to sort of teach your your kids uh, about classical music and give them a, a way in through animals, this is a wonderful way to do it. So that is from Naxos. Look it up as uh, Carnival of the Animals from Naxos, and you will come up with this. It otherwise does not have a a title necessarily. It's just a collection of music. And then uh, World Champions uh, from the 2019 World Series. That is out. The uh, Nationals get their little celebratory Blu-ray. That is from uh, Shout Factory and Major League Baseball. It's pretty much just everything that was on television, uh, plus highlights. And then uh, Volume 2 of The Art of Ohad Naharin with Batsheva, the Young Ensemble. This is the uh, National Dance Theater of Chaillot in France from uh, Bel Air Classics. And um, it's, you know, modern dance. It's not exactly my thing either. But, um, you know, if, if Ohad Naharin is a name that resonates with you, uh, then you will want to watch uh, an hour and 15 minutes of modern dance, beautifully, beautifully choreographed and um, uh, staged. There we go. I uh, got a big old stack of uh, Kino Lorbers over here, I believe is what these are. Kino Lorbers over here, I believe is what these are. I'll just go through these right quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, Iceman, 1984 film. I remember that. Yeah. Um, well, I was talking uh, about Cavemen and Ega. Uh, it's basically yeah. basically the same movie, except it's done legit. Uh, yeah, it, it, it takes itself quite seriously for a Shepsi film. Uh, uh, this, um, uh, yeah, it, it's a film uh, about an actual frozen man, uh, Timothy Hutton, uh, Lindsay Krauss from House of Games, uh, the scientists on an expedition. They find a man frozen, a 40,000 year old man frozen. <laughs> and they uh, unfreeze him and bring him back to life. And, it's yeah. a ridiculous plot, somehow made legit by by Skepsi. By by in, in, yeah, the, but the, the serious way in which in which they take it is you know, you produce Norman Jewison is one of the producers in this film, and 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 it, and it kind of works in this in this particular way. I don't think the science uh, is actually legitimate here, uh, but the sort of ideas of what it would mean to take a forty thousand year old uh, person and bring them back to life in contemporary, at least contemporary to the day of 19, uh, 1983, anyway, uh, uh, and what that would mean. Now, try doing that uh, same 40,000-year-old man, bring his ass back to 2020, uh, uh, <laughs> and give him an Instagram account, see how, that, see how that movie works out then. The Nude Bomb, Don Adams uh, as uh, Agent I am, very, I am very forgiving of this movie. <laughs> I, this movie is perfectly fantastic with me. And again, I love the concept, 1980 film. Everybody comes back for this for this feature film version of the Get Smart television series. Actually, uh, you know, a, a, a horrible villain is threatening to uh, set off a bomb that will destroy all of the fabric in the world. Just the fabric. No people, no buildings, it's no anything. It's hysterical. It's fantastic. <laughs> I watched this movie and I think to myself, what's the problem? Uh, it's, it's, dude, set off the bomb. I ain't yeah, yeah, I ain't worried about it. Yeah. A lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff. Nevertheless, uh, audio commentary uh, by Sledge Hammer creator Alan Spencer, who made this film called Hexed back in the middle '90s, early '90s, and I remember interviewing him at the Jerry's Deli that used to be on Ventura Boulevard. Uh, uh, Alan Spencer, uh, he was a funny, funny guy uh, that did a lot of funny stuff back in the day. Audio commentary uh, by him, uh, film historians, uh, deleted scenes, alternative dialogue scenes because I imagine they did a whole lot of ad-libbing on this movie, uh, et cetera, et cetera, behind-the-scenes behind the footage from 1980. 1980, 94 minutes long of the nude bomb. I think uh, Don left us. He's not with us anymore, if I'm not mistaken. I think yeah, he, he, I, I think you're right. He's gone, he's gone. Uh, Paradise, a wonderful uh, Mary Agnes Donahue film uh, from 1980, I believe, uh, maybe a little bit longer, maybe 1991 or something like that. Uh, Don Johnson. And Melanie Griffiths, interesting, uh, in that Don and Melanie uh, are playing husband and wife in this series. I think they were actually still together at that time. Uh, a, a young, 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 I mean, child, Elijah Wood in this movie. It's about a couple uh, whose, whose marriage and life are sort of falling apart. And this one summer, a young boy, played by Elijah Wood, comes to live with them. And it's about how uh, he pulls them back together uh, again. It's a perfectly lovely film from Mary Agnes Donahue. Um, uh, and uh, you know, great to see, great to see uh, Melanie Griffith and Don Johnson together, young and vibrant, and sort of fantastic. Um, uh, a commentary on the track from the same film historian Peter Tunguet. Uh, I, I remember watching that movie back in the day; thoroughly enjoyed it. 
from the um, let's see, uh, middle '90s, I think maybe '97, 1997. David Duchovny and Timothy Hutton again, Angelina Jolie and playing God. Yeah, uh, kind of a sharp thriller at the time. Yeah. Did okay at the yeah. box office. I don't, I don't remember doing the junket for this. Uh, neat movie. David Duchovny plays this uh, disgraced surgeon. Yeah. He gets pulled into the world of uh, gangsters and criminals. He he becomes this uh, you know bullet bullet hole doctor. You get shot, stabbed, something like that. They go get David Duchovny. Uh, they you, he's he's got all kinds of debt. They pay him in cash. Timothy Hutton playing a sort of crunchy bad guy in this. I, I, I thoroughly remember enjoying that um, Andy Wilson film. Audio commentary includes uh, some some stuff from the producers, from the writer Mark Haskell Smith. Neat David Duchovny film uh, from back in the day. Uh, and here we have uh, a really good uh, Paul Schrader film with Richard Pryor. Oh, so good. Uh, Blue Collar. Uh, yap at Kodo in the film. Just a fantastic film. Harvey Keitel, uh, blue collar workers uh, uh, who movie. decide uh, because they're, they're they're not making any money and the union isn't helping them out. Now, what's interesting in this film, it's that it's the union yeah. that they decide to rob because the union yeah. is corrupt, which was an interesting and sort of sort of a uh, uh, controversial way to go. Uh, particularly in 1978s when yeah. unions were big and strong. And uh, I think Jimmy Jimmy Hoffa might have been gone for yeah. a couple of years. I think he yeah. disappeared in 75. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, at a time when you, this is before the 1980 uh, Ronald yeah. Reagan breaking the unions, stuff like this was an interesting sort of point of view. It's about how it all goes wrong and the friendships fall apart. But Richard Pryor, funny as hell in this movie, but also showing his dramatic chops already. In yeah. this movie, yeah. uh, Harvey Keitel and the wonderful Yapit Kodo. I, I am that that every time I watch that movie, I am I reminded of how sad it is that Richard Pryor didn't do more dramatic work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he he really had, but he just they they got him into a groove and he was making money and, and I then, can't and, blame the man. And there but it was, yeah. Boy, he really had dramatic chops. When he showed the dramatic chops, I'll, I'll give you a couple of movies. A movie called Some Kind of Hero. Yeah. Uh, where he plays a Vietnam vet, he comes yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, he's funny, funny movie. But Richard shows has a chance to show his dramatic chops yeah. in that movie. Also, in any which way, uh, which way is up? Which way is up? That's right. Yeah, yeah opposite line. Let me keep. Plays a bunch of different characters in that yeah. film, but the central guy that he plays has some really great dramatic yeah. stuff that he gets to do. Uh, in that movie, Mad Love, Crystal Donnell and Drew Barrymore in this movie that I remember enjoying. Antonio Bird film, yeah, uh, Antonio Bird film, uh, uh, from way back in the in the day. Uh, a young straight uh, yeah. uh, 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 guy uh, falls in love with this wild, wild girl played by Drew Barrymore, uh, and uh, when it, they're not going to be able to see each other, whether their families are going to separate them, and they run off together. Yeah, uh, it's just a you know, it's, it's a beautiful, wild and love sort of movie. I don't think you could make this as a feature film you anymore. Couldn't. This you lives, couldn't. this lives on Netflix now. Yes, yeah, you're right. Like that. Could be a feature Moore, film today. Uh, and Chris O'Donnell. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, David Keith, Tuesday Well, and Charlie Slatterer in uh, Hotel Heartbreak. Yeah. Uh, I, I love this movie. Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak Hotel. Thank yeah. you very much. I, I love this movie. Set in 1972. Yeah. Uh, and they kidnapped Elvis. And and going now. First of all, you couldn't do that today. Can't either. do that today yeah. <laughs> because you know Elvis is gone, uh, and uh, he, he steals his mother's pink Cadillac, and they go on a road trip. A lot of fun these movies. And one of just, just occurring to me is you can't make any of these movies today. I did do the junket for this one, Ridley Scott's movie, White Squall. Yeah. Uh, starring Jeff Bridges and a whole bunch of young folks who would go on to have careers. I did not mind this. I look back on this and I think that this and the uh, what's the other sailing movie with uh, Matthew Modine and Jeff. Oh, uh, Wind. Wind. Yeah. I, you know, I look back and I actually I'm very forgiving of both of them. They yeah. Make, they make me want to go sailing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. But loosely based on true stories. Both of these. This one about yeah. a, a group of young a group of young men who go out with this uh, seasoned captain to learn yeah. you know fortitude and all this kind of stuff and they get hit by a white, white swan. All, uh, loosely based on a true story, and it's all about what happens there. And again, you know, you got Scott Wolf and a whole bunch of young actors uh, who would go on there, Ryan Felipe, who would go on to have some interesting sort of kills, John Savage and others in the film, White Squall. So got some uh, some Kino classics here, and then we'll go into some other Kinos. Everything left on the show is Kino, by the way. This is the Kino show, because <laughs> Kino... You know, has been cutting some crazy deals, and uh, they ordain certain films to be part of their Kino Classics line, and I could not be happier than uh, I am about this one, because we had, uh, just a couple of years ago, Rodan yeah. released, uh, which was a kind of a biopic about Rodan, and it was, it's been, Cohen did a wonderful job releasing it, but the original great story about Rodan is Camille Claudel, yeah. starring Gerard Depardieu as Rodin and Isabella Gianni in an Oscar-nominated performance as his greatest student, Camille Claudel. 
And the story of Camille Claudel, we also had another Camille Claudel movie a few years ago uh, about her time in an asylum starring um, uh, Juliette Binoche, which was by, which was not a good film. But this is a masterpiece. It's one of my all-time favorite scores by Gabrielle Yared as well. It's just a magnificent movie. And um, the story of Camille Claudel and uh, Rodin is incredible because it is tempestuous and they, they had a romance, but they were a teacher and a uh, student. And her work, of course, at a certain point winds up uh, transcending his and... It you know her her struggles with mental illness. It's just it's an it's an amazing epic. It is a beautiful film, and it's almost three hours long, and you don't feel a minute of it. It has some of the best camera work ever in this film. Yeah, it was directed by Bruno Neuten, who at the time was Isabella Gianni's partner. Mm. But Bruno, of course, is famously also formerly a cinematographer. He shot Jean de Florette and Manana the Spring and many many other great films. So he comes to directing with and the cinematographer's eye and it's just magnificent um uh, Isabella Gianni has never been better Gerard Depardieu has rarely been better and uh it's a superb film it has some great extras on it a trailer an essay and a great audio commentary by uh, film historian Sam Dean uh which is really really uh hit, nails hits all the points perfectly and it's a real solid uh blu-ray transfer also on their uh, Kino Classics line, another great one from France, A Sunday in the Country, the legendary Bernard Tavernier film, which yeah. is uh, also wonderful from 1984. Uh, this is, you know, Tavernier is also one of my favorite all-time filmmakers. Um, this is just one of his most beautiful pastoral films set uh, just on the uh, eve of World War I in the French countryside, deals with uh, the politics of a family, the, you know, Sabina Azima and Michel Aumont, and it's just... It's just wonderful. It's like uh, my dinner with French people on the eve of World War One. Yeah, that's what it is. It is. It's a superb film, and I'm I'm elated that that's out on Blu-ray as well. Uh, the last two Kino classics. One, I'll do the uh, the the more recent one. The boat is full by Marcus Imhoof. This was a 1981 foreign language film nominee. And uh, it's, a, it's a German film that deals primarily with um, the refugee situation around the time of World War II. Uh, it did, of course, not win the Foreign Language Film Award at that time, but it, uh, it certainly has a lot of relevance in our current day with refugees. And, you know, I, I, as I was involved in a short film called Refugee, it really hits home. Uh, it is a, it's, it's really a beautifully made film, beautifully, beautifully directed. And uh, Marcus Imhoff, if you've never heard of him, deserves to be rediscovered at this time. And then lastly, we have Flo Ziegfeld's Glorifying the American Girl. Uh, what an artifact this is. Uh, this has some Technicolor sequences in it, which is amazing because this damn thing was made in 1929. That's two-strip Technicolor at the mm. time, by the way. Mm. This is uh, really a, a kind of a, 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 an artifact of an entire different area that gives you some insight into um, where Busby Berkeley kind of came from because he, at a certain point, worked for Florence Ziegfeld uh, in the Ziegfeld Follies. And this also co-stars Eddie Cantor, who did a lot of shows that Busby Berkeley staged on Broadway, and then Busby staged things in some of his first Sam Goldwyn movies in uh, in Hollywood. So uh, this is a real, really uh, a fascinating little uh, little artifact of the past, produced by Adolf Zucker and Jesse Lasky, who of course would be the founders of Paramount Pictures, and has an audio commentary by Richard Barrios, the author of A Song in the Dark, The Birth of the Musical Film, uh, has a seven-minute travel log on Hollywood, a Hearst Metrotone newsreel excerpt about Ziegfeld, a uh, 1934 Technicolor short called La Cucaracha, and uh, it's great. This is really, really a lot of fun. Glorifying the American Girl, presented by Florence Ziegfeld, with Eddie Cantor, Helen Morgan, and Rudy Valley. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, let's see. I uh, want to get also into... Yeah, let me let me do this real quickly here. Got got a bunch of um, Studio Canal is where all the French stuff comes from when Kino cut their deal with Studio Canal. So they got a bunch of Studio Canal stuff. It's not all French. Much of it is, but not all of it. Studio Canal has a very large library. So uh, here's some of the stuff that uh, Kino has been able to raid from the Studio Canal library. 1984 is Dog Day uh, with uh, Lee Marvin. Otherwise, everybody else in this thing is French. It's basically a French film with Lee Marvin. 
and uh, is an elderly Marvin, but he just he grabs a gun and he's you know he's he's on fire. Uh, he plays a gangster who is uh, trying to evade the law with his loot in France, and um, it uh, it winds up being a. a it's not really a noir. It, it's just kind of a character study. It's a Lee Marvin character study. And, he, he, you know, he, he, he was a tough bastard right to yeah, the end. Boy. I mean, he, he died soon after this, 1984. But great, uh, great audio commentary from uh, Howard Berger and Steve Mitchell. And uh, there is French and English audio on this uh, for all of you who care. Also have Chuck Connors in Kill Them All and Come Back Alone. Kind of a spaghetti western from 1968, except a spaghetti western that stars Chuck Connors, which is a little bit weird. Uh, but yeah, the uh, this is directed by Enzo Castellari, who of course was one of the guys who made those movies, including the original Inglorious Bastards that inspired Tarantino. Chuck Connors not exactly a spaghetti western guy, but he's he's perfectly fine here. The idea is it's about a bunch of uh, Confederates who are trying to steal gold from a fortress uh, of, in, of the Union Army in the closing days of the Civil War. Um, the the thing that makes this most interesting is that Alex Cox, who doesn't make movies anymore, he just does commentaries on other people's movies, does a really fun commentary. And um, I don't know why they have two different cuts on here. There's only a minute difference between them. Uh, the uh, the Italian cut is one minute longer at 100 minutes. I don't really see the point. But anyway, they're both on here. Beautiful photography, though, more than, more than anything else. From 1968, uh, kill, them ba- kill Them All and Come Back Alone. Totally great Italian title. Uh, also from the Studio Canal line is uh, The Holly and the Ivy, uh, a wonderful, unusual Christmas film from 1952, British film with the amazing cast of Ralph Richardson, Celia Johnson, uh, Margaret Layton, and Denholm Elliott. It's an absolutely terrific cast. And it's a lovely... It's, it, it's, a, it is a, it's very much a Christmas film. It's just not an American Christmas film. Uh, directed by George Moore O'Farrell. And uh, it's, sort of, it's basically a, a post-World War II Christmas film. So very much your, the, the shadow of World War II and the aftermath is still... Um, Still cast on this, but it's still one of those, uh, you know, find the real meaning in Christmas movies. And Celia Johnson, who, of course, was in the original Brief Encounter, is just uh, one of the most amazing screen talents of all time. Charles Bronson and Anthony Perkins in Someone Behind the Door. Uh, you can imagine what that's all about. Uh, it's it, This was made in 1971. It looks and feels like a 1971 film. It's uh, not as violent as I probably wished it was. But it's uh, it's got a an interesting little uh, kind of noirish twist to it, involving Jill Ireland, who of course at the time was Charles Bronson's wife, and um, a kind of a, a twisted little noiry scheme uh, that involves um, amnesia. I'll just leave you with that. It's 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 got a little bit of amnesia to it, um, but uh, it, it's it's. Uh, it's an, for 1971 Bronson film, it's better than most. And then Charles Bronson also shows up with Alain Delon, the French star in Farewell Friend, directed by Gene Herman. And uh, that's a good little kind of crossover American-French action bit as well. Um, it's kind of weird to pair Charles Bronson and Alain Delon, but it, it, it kind of sort of works. I don't know that it uh, made a whole lot of money in the U.S., but uh, this is from 1968. And then Alain Delon by himself in two other films that are a little bit more significant, uh, Diabolically Yours by Julien Duvivier and En Flic, which means a cop, by Jean-Pierre Melville, the great legendary uh, Jean-Pierre Melville uh, gangster film. The En Flic is really the best film of all of these. It's Alain Delon, Catherine Deneuve, and Richard Crenna holding down the American end of things. And uh, it is one of Melville's final films. It is one of his best films, I think. Has a great commentary by Sam Dean, and uh, interviews with Delon's brother and uh, uh, Melville's daughter, or, or I'm sorry, Jean Gabin's daughter. Uh, uh, Jean Gabin, of course, who is a great French actor who was directed uh, many, many times by uh, Melville as well. And um, it's a it, it's a it's a it's a really really good script and a really dense kind of noirish conspiracy story that uh with these these bank robbers and um 
this, uh, the, the politics of the police force. It's really, really interesting and uh, incredibly well written and, and a really difficult balancing act dramatically. Um, you realize what a great director Melville was when you see something that's this kind of thematically dense. Uh, Diabolically Yours, Alain Delon and Santa Berger is, a, is, you know, more standard Delon fare from the period. This is 1967. Um, it's not brilliant or anything, but it has a good commentary that kind of gives you a sense of Delon's significance at the time and how he figured out, how he figured into French cinema and European cinema more generally. Uh, Julien Duvivier is a better director than what this would normally suggest, but, you know, it has its place, and there it is, Diabolically Yours. What else we got, Tim? Uh, more Kino Lorber, some Yay. of which, this, all of this stuff is fairly interesting to me because I, in one way or another, uh, either uh, yeah, 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 junkets or in red carpets or in uh, actual interviews, I, I, I did press and journalism <laughs> for every one of these films uh, that I have in my hand right now, including um, uh, the Amy Fisher story, Tony Dennison and, and uh, Harley Jane Kozak in this film, <coughs> um, uh, Drew Barrymore. Excuse me, playing Amy Fisher in this film, directed by Andy Tennant. Believe it or not, very interesting that Andy Tennant directed this film. Yeah, uh, this is before Fools Rush In. This is called, so uh, back in 1992. Uh, 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 Amy Fisher uh, shot Mary Jo Botafuco in the head. She was apparently having perhaps an affair with uh, could, Joey Botafuco. Could I just say this? Yeah. If their last name was Smith, yeah, this nobody would have cared about this. Yeah, this it's only because, counts because of Butterfuco. It's because his name was Butterfuco, yeah. and because everybody and their grandmother was making jokes about that name. And and you know he, he I don't know if people remember this guy, but he was a Butterfuco. Oh, you know he, he was, was a Butterfuco. He was, he was, there he was, was such a, a uh, Look, nothing like this guy. So th there was this movie, and another one uh, that they made for television as well. Anyway, um, um, Andy Tennant directing this film. Um, uh, uh, certainly Drew Barrymore. I kind of gave her her career back. This film. Uh, Drew had been on a spiraling sort of, uh, I don't know if you call it a nightmare, but a mess of all kinds of married, that nutty Tom Green guy. And uh, it was just, a, just a, and this, and then eventually that Charlie's Angels film, and it kind of gave her yeah. career back, and she became the sort of, uh, something of a mogul that she is today. Anyway, this uh, includes some uh, special features, uh, the audio commentary from historian uh, Sally Christie. Uh, 1993 film on the events of 1992 involving the shooting of uh, Mary Jo Buttafuoco by Amy Fisher. Eddie Murphy, I remember this film so well, 1998 film, did the junket for this. Uh, Holy Man, uh, interesting film again. Uh, the film did not fare that well back in 1998. By, by today's standards, though, for one thing, this film was funny even back then, but in terms of content, uh, today it seems prescient about a whole bunch of things. Home Shopping Network, uh, uh, the, the, the producer of the Home Shopping Network show, the sales are falling, they're not making any money. Uh, he hits this guy, this uh, sort of holy man guy on a corner with his car, and he gets involved with him. Next thing you know, this guy is on the Home Shopping network uh, is selling a sort of spiritualism that has really nothing to do with buying stuff, but it gets people to start buying stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum in the movie, Kelly Preston in the movie, Robert Loggia, uh, John Cryer. Uh, Eddie Murphy's so funny in this movie. We've been talking about Eddie, Eddie all season, of course, yeah. because of um, uh, uh, Dolomite Don't is my name. Uh, but again, I look at Eddie here. He has the shaved head. He has that, you know, that famous Eddie Murphy mustache, and he looks more or less exactly the same as he did in this movie. I saw this movie not too long ago just because it popped up on television. I'm telling you, it's just as funny as it ever was. It just is. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wrong. Um, <laughs> Which has a whole new meaning now. Yeah. Because Ellen was not out at the time. It's not at all. 1996. And, uh, uh, I just... I, just that, not out at all. Not, not the other... I know. Know. And uh, there's a movie about Ellen looking for a husband, and Mr. Wrong, Mr. Right. I Bill wonder Pullman. how Ellen felt when they offered her this project. Uh, I wonder how, how hard she must have laughed or cried. She had to, you know, look, because at the time, to be honest with you, watching this film at the time, I did not know Ellen, who had a very different sort of demeanor and presentation. Yeah. And in, in the middle 90s, early yes. 80s, you know, you know so she, she was kind of feminine with the long yeah. blonde hair and all that. Yeah. Lovely, yeah. lovely. I didn't think of thing. I, I didn't have a thought about it. Nobody did. Uh, but there you go. She uh, was kind of doing the same thing. That's. Uh, I mean, you know, there were a lot of female comics who were doing a little bit of an alternative thing. There was Elaine Boozler. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there were a whole bunch of them at the time. And uh, what's her what's her name? Uh, who uh, 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 Kathy Griffin? Oh, Kathy, Kathy Griffin. Griffin yeah. Was doing it then too. Yeah. I will say this though. I I I, I believe because she's more or less playing the same character uh, uh, to some extent as she does ultimately in that sitcom. 
uh, you know, where it, when that sitcom starts, she's, she's she's still not gay. Ellen's going on dates in that sitcom yeah. for a whole bunch of seasons uh, before that that the end of that show hits and, uh, and it changes everything. Burt Reynolds in this um, in this Elmore Leonard adaptation stick. 1985. Yeah. Love this movie. Yeah, I, I, love this movie. Bert, Bert, from Sharky's Machine to Stick, he yeah. made a number of really great, uh, gritty, underrated, gritty cop films. Yeah, and, you know, crime films. Yeah, uh, where he started. Anyway, this one, he's uh, yeah, he's he's this guy. His 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 cellmate from prison gets killed. He gets yeah. drawn into this whole underworld sort of thing. This is just one hell of a movie. George Siegel, Candace Bergen. Uh, yeah. Bergen, uh, Charles Journey in the film. Thoroughly loved it. Audio commentary here from uh, film critic Nick Pinkerton. Behind the scenes stuff, trailers. A lot of fun here. Elmore Leonard yep. uh, pinning, uh, well, the the, 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 the novel. Yeah. Uh, and also working on the script. Great. For that Great movie. Uh, for Strangers Among Us, 1992 film, I remembered having a very long conversation with Sid and Lamette uh, on the phone. Uh, I did the junket. Uh, Melanie was there, and all you know, yeah, yeah, the the other folks in the in the film was at the junket for this. But Sidney Lumet was not there, uh, and they took a list of names yeah. of folks who Sidney would give a call. I'm at home, living in Westwood at the time. Me and yeah. Bridge living in Westwood at the time. I get a phone call on an actual landline phone, uh, and it's, "Hello, this is Sidney Lumet." Yeah, and I'm like. <laughs> like, you know, tried to play it cool. Had a long conversation with Sid Lumet about a number of things, including this film, which was an interesting con- thing because I didn't really care for this film. Yeah, it's about an undercover cop played by Melanie Griffith who goes into this Hasidic, uh, Hasidic community undercover to uh, to investigate a murder. Uh, and obviously, this community uh, this community is very you know um, uh, doesn't exactly want to let her into, into all the secrets yeah. and cults and all sorts of stuff that's going on there. Melanie Griffith was the weak thing in this film the idea was really really very good but you know it was my 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 chance to sit to have a long phone conversation anyway with the late and wonderful director Sidney Lumet uh Terminal Velocity um what I remember not, about this 1999 I did the, I did the junk you did the junk for this one too yeah I did uh, uh is you know look this was uh, David Twavy writing here Charlie Sheen and Natasha Kinski yeah. I remember sitting across from Natasha Kinski thinking Jesus, you're beautiful. Yeah, just this is just insane how beautiful you are. Yeah. Tess, of course, of the uh, when she was like only 16 years old, she had yeah. done, but she looked exactly the same in 1994. I think Tess might have been what 76, 78, 70, late 70s, late 70s, yeah, for sure. 1994, yeah. she looked exactly the same. Uh, this was directed by Darren Serafian, yeah, who uh, my wife had worked with on a couple of films, the whole Serafian clan, right? The dad's an actor, you know, Richard, and anyway. And and uh, I, it, I actually had uh, this was a, I, I reconnected with Charlie for the first time on that at a certain uh, we had a one on one we yeah. basically sat there for about an hour <laughs> they, they, it was supposed to be a half an hour and Charlie's like you know he's brushing him off and we just, we just kind of caught up and uh, he told me about everybody from high school who had tried to screw him over yeah and, you know it's, it was it was sad it was it was really sad because a lot of people really tried to take advantage of him when he suddenly was somebody. And um, so that was a good. That, that's my that's my fond remembrance of Terminal Velocity Press yeah. Day. I didn't like the movie, but it was good to catch up with Charlie. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of jumping out of airplanes in this movie. Yeah, uh, it would be parachute yeah. stuff again. Uh, a lot of neat sort of blue uh, screen stuff. Yeah, as opposed to what they would do today. Yeah, that would all be a bunch of digital poo. Yeah. So this is better. Uh, all kinds of special features too. So great stuff. And just a few more from the uh, Kino Blast of uh, late 2019, early 2020. We've got volume six of the Pink Panther collection with everything from 1978 to 1980. People often forget that the Pink Panther cartoons did go all the way right up to about 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's still first rate right in there. I mean, they kept the style and the music and the approach and everything. It's just it's a it's a unique, a a, a unique collection of, uh, of shorts. And uh, bravo to uh, to Frizz Freeling and the uh, the animators for, for doing that. You get select audio commentaries on here for you if you want to hear a little bit more about the animation and the history. Plus a featurette called uh, Pink Links by Greg Ford and William Hohauser, and a thing on a little remembrance of Frizz Freeling. Uh, and the Pink Panther Flakes commercial, which is a, which is a cute thing to add. Yes. Um, really eccentric, odd movie is just visiting with Jean Reno, Christina Applegate, and Christian Clavier. The reason this is weird is because it's a remake of a French film yeah. that also starred Jean Reno and Christian Clavier called Les Visiteurs, which yeah. is about a couple of medieval guys who you know time-traveled to the present day. It's a fish-out-of-water thing. It's 
you know, we've it, it's 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 been done a million times before. Um, and it, 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 the French film is a lot funnier, but because they stuck Christina Applegate in this, it's got a certain level of novelty. But anyway, there are two of those French films. Yeah, Jean, Jean yes, the Les Visiteurs number two yeah. as well. And uh, Jean Marie Gobert, who did the original film, also directed this. So I don't know how much fun there is in everybody who made the first film to go and do it all over again, <laughs> except now we've got Christina yeah. Applegate. Yeah, not Doesn't the really first time, sense. not the first time. Anyway, it didn't really pan out, but there's an interesting commentary on here by uh, Brian Reisman, who's a journalist and entertainment uh, reporter. And, um, you know, I, I would recommend just watching the French one, but still, it's a little bit weird that that came out. For people who are fascinated by uh, Ryan Johnson's uh, turn into whodunit movies ah, knives uh, out. with Knives Out, mm. you get to watch Brick, which is uh, his original detective movie with Joseph Gordon-Levitt from Thoroughly 2005. enjoyed that film, man. Thoroughly enjoyed that film. 2005, L- Joseph Gordon-Levitt, terrific in this, right? It's uh, just it's sharp writing too, you know. It is and, sharp and, writing. and so when Knives Out happened, yeah, he's doing something there where he's you know everybody's talking about like a you know, sort of a noir. Yes, it's set in high school. Yeah, and everybody's into this noir sort of thing. But when Knives Out, I, was, I, I thought to myself, no, this is actually Ryan Johnson going back to original yeah. Ryan Johnson. It's doing what he what he fundamentally wanted to do all along. He's not a Star Wars guy, no. he's a genre guy. He's a detective guy. So uh, there's an audio commentary that he does on here with a couple of the actors and uh, his producer and production designer and costume designer. They all get together and uh, and have a chat. Uh, some deleted and extended scenes, which he introduces, and um, and you know it's uh, it is a sharp little film. Yep. Got some kind of schlocky classic stuff uh, from the well, gosh, the the 40s and 50s and 60s primarily here. But they all, they're all kind of in the same genre. Um, from the 40, 1940s, we have the, uh, the movie Cobra Woman with Maria Montez, John Hall, and Sabu, uh, all of them backing up Lon Chaney, yeah. who just um, really is kind I don't know. Sabu. You know. I love Sabu. Sabu is good. Short, short career, but really, yeah. uh, anyway... This is, you know, just kind of a this kind of a, a silly adventure movie with Sabu doing what he usually does. All of it, uh, you know, dealing with a uh, a lost tribe on a Pacific island, and and, and uh, you know, Maria Montez gets kidnapped. It's it's quite silly. It's you know, it's what you'd expect from a movie called Cobra Woman. Uh, then we also have The Slasher with a very young Joan Collins, directed by Lewis Gilbert. This is from 1953. Uh, it's a teen delinquent movie. It, it you know it, it's it's all about delinquent teens in London and uh, you know they're robbing people and uh, it, it it's almost like the Blackboard Jungle set in London in some sense, but it's certainly part of the whole teen delinquency thing in the 1950s when everybody was kind of freaking out over uh, crime from the the young yeah. generation that just it didn't understand what was fought for from World War II. Uh, and young was, Joan Collins, young though. Joan Collins, so beautiful. And uh, Lewis Gilbert, of course, who would go on to do a couple of James Bond films uh, in subsequent years, uh, really kind of uh, acing it here, doing very, very good work, both as a writer and a director. Uh, Then Conga. Hey, somebody made a King Kong movie. Why don't we make one? What are we going to call it? I don't know. (laughs) Conga. No one will make the connection. It's a King Kong knockoff. Uh, It's ridiculous. Uh, It's really a completely silly film, but it's it's so silly that you, you have to see it to believe it. This is, of course, a uh, an AIP film, as most knockoffs of the era were, Sam Markoff and, and his crew. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let's see. King Kong was a gorilla. What are, what's ours going to be? Oh, a chimp. <laughs> so silly. That's a big chimp. Uh, it's, it's a gorilla-sized chimp that turns into a monster. Anyway, it's a completely silly movie. But but it's, it's, uh, it's fun in its own weird, kitschy, exploitative way. And then from 1962, when everything was about sword and sandal epics, The Magic Sword, from producer Burt Gordon. Uh, this is a pretty decent cast. Basil Rathbone, uh, Gary Lockwood, Anne Helm, Estelle Winwood. Um, but it's still a silly movie. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's just... Um, Burt I. Burt I. Gordon. Burt Gordon, yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's, it, it's silly. Basil Rathbone tries really hard to sort of take it all seriously, as does Gary Lockwood. Um, who would go on to redeem himself in 2001 at the end of the decade. This was made in 1962. Um, but, you know. Bird's still around. Bird made a movie 2015. 
Uh, did he really? Yep. Secrets of a Psychopath. Yep. Really? He's Absolutely. still doing it? How old is he now? Oh, uh, 1922. How old oh, is he Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He's, he's, he's creeping up on 198. He's 98 years old. Wow. All right. Well, anyway, uh, The Magic Sword, just kind of a silly uh, medieval period drama um, that really tries to push a lot of the exploitation buttons at the same time as it pushes the monster movie buttons. Um, tries to sort of do a little bit what they were doing at AIP with the, uh, the Poe films. Um, anyway, you know, fair enough. Okay, so with that, we are done this week. Uh, come on, see us on the uh, on February second at the uh, at the Ace Hotel and Theater downtown Los Angeles, doing our Oscar prognostication. We'll see you guys then. <laughs> Thank you.